who is the Antichrist? What is the identity of the Antichrist? Okay, now this topic has really been, I would say, swept under the rug by much of the Christian world. Many people believe that the Antichrist was in the past. Some people think that the Antichrist is some unknown being in the future. But friends, you will see tonight that the Antichrist is existing today. It's in power today. And the Bible says in the three angels message of Revelation 14, that this Antichrist, this beast, would have a mark that he would give to all the world. And so before we study the mark, we must identify who this beast is. And that is our goal this evening. And speaking of that beast and his mark, we turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. This is the third angel's message, God's last warning to the world. And in this scripture we read, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And so friends, this message, this, this warning about the beast and his mark deserves our greatest attention. This is the most urgent message in all of scripture. This is a last day warning to a dying world and God is wanting them to be protected, to be protected from the mark of the beast. Yes, these three angels messages, the Bible says they will go to the world with a loud voice and the warning is solemn and the warning is critical for us to understand this evening. And so according to God's word, we want to identify this beast. But according to the Bible, what does a beast represent in Bible prophecy? Now, friends, it's very important as we discover and study the book of Revelation and Daniel that we don't make a private interpretation. We don't want to have any man's opinion. I don't want you to have my opinion. I want you to have God's true word. And a mistake that many people make as they study Daniel and Revelation is they do not compare Scripture with Scripture. We must, and don't miss this, we must let the Bible interpret itself. We must let God's Word interpret itself. We cannot give it our own opinion. And so according to the Bible, what does a beast represent? We read in Daniel, these great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. And so we're starting to see clues that a beast is representing a king, and you'll see it's also a kingdom, because we see in Daniel 7.23, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and tread it down and break it into pieces. And so according to the Bible, a beast represents a king or a kingdom. So as we read about a beast in apocalyptic prophecy, our mind should be thinking kingdom or a king. The Bible uses those terms interchangeably. All right, so let's learn more about this beast of Revelation that would inflict his mark upon the world. And we read in Revelation 13, 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So friends, here's a description, and here is a, a picture of this, a representation of this beast. The Bible says that it would have seven heads, and it would have ten horns, and that this beast would arise out of the sea. Okay, so once again, let us let the Bible interpret itself. We don't often see beasts like this. We cannot go to the local zoo in Manila and see this beast in a cage. This is a symbolic beast. It's representative. And so are the waters that it arises out of. And so these waters that brought forth this beast, what do they represent? What does a sea 
represent in Bible prophecy? Well, the Bible reveals the answer. We see in Revelation 17, 15, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. All right, so according to Scripture, the waters, when we see that term in Bible prophecy, when we see that term in apocalyptic books like Daniel and Revelation, waters are representing multitudes of people. It is a heavily populated area. Okay, so we see this beast, and it's coming up out of a populated area. It's arising out of the sea. And so here we have our first identifying mark of the beast. We can see that it would arise out of a heavily populated area. And friends, what we will do this evening is we will travel through Revelation, Revelation 13, and we will identify the nine identifying marks of the Antichrist. And then we will simply take a look into history and we will see if there is a power that matches with these nine identifying marks. Okay, that's our plan for this evening. And so we can see that our first identifier is that this beast would arise out of a heavily populated area. The Bible says it would come out of the sea. And as we continue to study this dreadful beast, the Bible says, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his great authority. All right, so this beast power that we read in Revelation 13, we see from God's word that it would receive its power, its seat, and its authority from the dragon. All right, and so now we're starting to understand our second clue. But according to the Bible, who or what does a dragon represent? Does anyone know who the dragon represents or what that represents? <clears throat> well, let's go to the Bible. Let's identify this, this um, dragon. And we see in Revelation chapter 20, verse 2, And he lay hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Okay, friends, so who is the dragon? It is Satan. Very good. The dragon is Satan. Yes, the dragon is none other than Satan, Lucifer. All right? And we know that from the scripture. However, Satan often works through human agencies. He often uses them as vessels or vehicles to do his will. And so what vehicle does Satan work through in the last days? Well, we can read about this. And it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. So there we have it again. We see this same symbolism of this great beast that has seven heads and ten horns. But notice what the Bible says about this beast. It's represented by the dragon. And it says, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour the child as it was born. And so this great dragon actually worked to try to um, and overpower, to try to kill or devour the child before it was born. Now, friends, who is that child that Satan tried to kill at a very early age? It was Jesus. Very good. Remember the decree by King Herod. Remember he made an, a decree, an order, to kill all of the young boys two years and younger. All right, so Herod was used by Satan. And specifically, Satan used the empire of Rome, of pagan Rome, to try to devour Jesus. And so the dragon then is representative not only of Satan, but the agency that he worked through, which we know is pagan Rome. All right. And so now we uh, review our identifying points. We've seen that it would arise out of a heavily populated area of the world. And now we see that it would receive its power, its seat, and its authority from pagan Rome. Now, friends, as I go through this message, 
I challenge and encourage you as we look at these identifying marks of this beast, this antichrist power, I encourage you to think back to history. Think to what you have learned about history. Maybe um, you took a social studies class. All right, see if you can identify who this power is. And that way you can actually tell me before we even look at history. And I think many of you may be able to determine that. Speaking more about this beast power, we read in Revelation chapter 13 and 3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. Okay, so this Antichrist, according to the Bible, would also receive a deadly wound. Okay, one of its heads was wounded to death. That's a deadly wound. But the Bible goes on and it says, and this deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And so we can see that this deadly wound that the beast would receive would also be healed and that this beast power would receive worldwide honor. Okay, is, are, are, is everyone on the same page so far? Is it clear so far? Yes? Yes, friends? You with me? Okay, praise God. And if not, you'll have your notes after, um, but I hope that it's been clear so far. Okay, so let us continue to study about this Antichrist power. Let us continue to see what God says about this being. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. Okay, so we see that this beast would reign for 42 months. Now, we have seen from the Bible that 42 months is actually mentioned seven times in the book of Daniel and Revelation. Now, what does that mean when God repeats something several times? It means that it is important. And so that's why God has repeated this time period seven times. All right, and I've listed the references there of where that is repeated. Okay, another thing that we know about this 42 months is in different places of Daniel and Revelation, the Bible refers to this time period with different ways. Uh, sometimes it's three and a half years, and sometimes it's 42 months, and sometimes it's 1260 days, all right? And so the Bible uses different time references to refer to this 42 month period. And we remember, if you remember our study of the 2300 day prophecy, you will remember that according to scripture, according to Bible prophecy, that one day equals, does anybody remember one day equals what? Equals one year. All right, we have some Bible students here today. Praise God. One day equals a year. And we get that not from our own interpretation, but we let the Bible interpret itself. Ezekiel 4, 6 and Numbers 14, 34 reveal to us that a day equals a year. And we know that this time period would be the period that the Antichrist would have power over the saints and it would rule for 1260 years, all right? Because if we do the math, we have 1260 days, okay? And that is one day for a year. And so this Antichrist power would rule for 1260 years. Okay, so just as a review, we've identified these four points and now our fifth point about the Antichrist is that it would rule over the saints for 1260 years years. Okay, I hope everything is clear so far. These are the identifying marks of the beast power. But let us continue to read what the Bible says about this beast. In Revelation chapter 13 and 6, we read, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Okay, so another identifying mark of this beast power is that it would blaspheme God, all right? And so this, this mysterious power that we are researching tonight, that we are identifying tonight, the Bible says that it would speak out, that it would blaspheme the name of God. And so what is blasphemy? How does the Bible define blasphemy? 
Well, let us let the Bible reveal this to us. We can read in Luke chapter 5, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, if you remember the story, Jesus, while he lived on this earth, he forgave sins, okay? Repeatedly, he claimed to forgive sins. Now, as the scribes and the Pharisees heard him do this, they accused him of blasphemy because only God can forgive sins. So claiming to forgive sins is one of the definitions of blasphemy according to the Bible. The Bible also says something else is blasphemy. Let's read of this in John 10, 33. The Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou being a man makest thyself God. So there we have the second identifier of blasphemy. According to scripture, claiming to be God is blasphemy. Only God is God. And so the Jews accused Jesus of blasphemy because he claimed to be God. All right, so those are our two definitions of blasphemy. Claiming to be God and for claiming to forgive sins. So again, this antichrist power would be guilty of blasphemy, claiming to forgive sins and claiming to be God. All right, so we have seen six identifying points of the beast. But let us continue. God does not want us to have any doubts of who this Antichrist is. It's almost as if I told the crowd here that I'm thinking about someone who is wearing a red shirt. A lot of you might say, well, that could be me. I, I looks like there's maybe, I don't know, three or four people with a red shirt. Maybe not. I guess red, y'all don't like the color red. But let's say a, a blue shirt. There might be three or four of you wearing a blue shirt. And so that's not very specific. But then if I said this person was born on this day, this person has a favorite food of this, this person's parents' name is this, this person went to school here, and they have this license plate number, notice how the more specific I get, the more clear the identity is. And so God is giving us repeated signs of who this Antichrist is so that we can have no doubt. It can be crystal clear the identity. God does not want us to be deceived and he doesn't want any of his people to receive the mark of the beast. And so he reveals clearly who the beast is. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God has been so clear. Um, so let's continue looking at what the Bible says about the Antichrist. We read in Revelation 13, 7, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindred and tongues and nations. All right. So according to the Bible, this power, this blasphemous beast power would actually make war with God's people. So we can see not only would be guilty of blasphemy, but it would make war with the saints, with God's people. The Bible goes on and it says, and they worship the dragon, which we know is that beast, which gave power unto the beast. Well, we know the dragon is Satan, which gave power to the beast. And they worship the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And so what we notice about this beast power is that it would actually receive worship. The Bible says that the world would actually worship this beast. And so it appears that this beast is some sort of religious power. We have already seen that this beast is a political power represented by a beast, meaning a kingdom. But we can also see that this beast would receive worship. Now begin to think in your mind, what is a kingdom or a nation in world history that is actually worshipped, that is actually a religious political power? And try to identify in your mind which nation is actually a religious and political power. 
The Bible also tells us, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so what we can see once again is that this beast power, this antichrist of revelation would actually receive worship. Okay, it says all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, but not all those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life would not worship the beast. And friends, I hope and pray that all of us, that all of us will be in that group that does not give this beast worship. I hope and pray that all of us will be written in that Lamb's book of life, those that do not give worship unto the beast. But we, receive that, we see that it would receive worship. And again, it would be a religious political power and it would receive worship. All right, and we see that right there. We saw that it would make war with the saints and that it would also receive worship. And the Bible continues, and it gives us yet another identifying mark of this beast. And we read of this in Revelation 13, 18, and the Bible tells us, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and six. And so you might have heard that number being referred to as 666. All right. And the Bible says that this number 666 is the number of a man. All right. So that is our final identifying point that we will consider this evening is that it would have the number of a man, which is the number of 666. All right. And so, friends, we've identified several points. We've seen several markers that God has wanted us to consider when we attempt to identify the Antichrist. And so who is the Antichrist? Which power has fulfilled every single one of these identifying marks? Who is it? This is the moment we've all been waiting for. Who could it be? Now, friends, it must match every single power because God can never be wrong. The Bible doesn't guess, it knows. And so let us see if there is a power in history that matches all nine of these identifiers. And friends, I wanna make the case tonight and I wanna make the bold and clear statements that the identity of the Antichrist is certain. In fact, all of the Protestant reformers, okay, the the belief of them was that the power representing the Antichrist was none other than the Roman church state, also known as the Catholic Church. Now, I want to make a disclaimer. When we are identifying this world power, we are not speaking about individuals within that church. We are talking about a system. We are talking about a system that has claimed to be God on earth that, me, that matches all of the identifying marks. All right, there are many Catholics that love Jesus. There are many Catholics that I believe we will see in heaven. And so we are not talking about individuals. God loves Catholics, but we are talking about a false system that the Bible has identified. But I don't want you to take my word for it. I don't want you to take what I say. I want us to go by the Bible. And I want us to go to history and see if we can find clear evidence that this power matches all of these identifying marks. All right, so let's go point by point. Once again, it must fulfill each of the powers. The first power that we identified is that this power would arise out of a heavily populated area of the world. Okay, does the papacy also known as the Catholic Church, does it match this identifying mark? Yes, it does. It perfectly matches it. We know that Vatican City, which is the headquarters of the papacy in northern Italy, um, in the area of Rome, did arise out of a heavily populated area of the world. In fact, as we look at where Italy and the papacy originated, it was the most populated densely populated area of the world at that time. Okay, right in the midst of central of Western Europe. Okay, and so that part is clear. 
And so we've seen that it matches point one. But let us look at our second identifying marker. The Bible says that this beast would receive its power, its seats, and its authority from pagan Rome. Is this true? Is papal Rome, also known as the papacy, also known as the Catholic Church, did they receive their power, their seat, and their authority from pagan Rome? Well, we can look at the history books, we can look at the evidence, and we can see that the answer is a resounding yes. They match this point perfectly. In fact, I have a quote here and it says, the mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized. Rome was transformed as well as converted. The very capital of the old empire became the capital of the Christian empire. And we can see that the, we also read here that the office of Pontifex Maximus was continued in that of the Pope. Even the Roman language has remained the official language of the Roman Catholic Church down through the ages. And so history tells us, and this was written by Alexander Clarence, The Rise of the Medieval Church, and history reveals that the papacy, also known as a Catholic Church, was simply a continuation of Rome. The very office of Pontifex Maximus of the Caesars was simply transferred over to that of the Bishop of Rome, also known as the Pope. The same language of the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, was continued into the papal Roman Empire. It was a smooth transition, and no historian would argue that. And so we can see that the papacy clearly matches the second point, that it would receive its power from Rome. But what about the third point, that it would receive a deadly wound? Did this happen in history? Well, let us consider history. And in fact, the papacy did receive a deadly wound. In fact, a French general by the name of General Berthier, this was one of Napoleon's leading generals, and after the French Reformation, which was really a movement against religion, this French General Berthier marched over to where the Pope was staying. In fact, this is Pope Pius VI. He took the Pope captive, and eventually the Pope died while he was in captivity. Now, this is very significant because prior to that year, for hundreds of years, the papacy dominated Europe. In fact, they dominated the, country, the, the continent so much that kings would have to ask the Pope if they could go to war. All right, so not only religiously, but politically, the pap uh, papal Rome, the Catholic Church, dominated Europe. So this was a deadly wound. The fact that a, um, a general of a country could take the Pope captive and the Pope died in captivity was a humbling moment for the papacy. All right, this was the deadly wound, and this took place in 1798. Remember that year, 1798. All right, so we have seen from the Bible that the papacy is matching these points with precision, with perfect accuracy. Now, our next identifying point is that the papacy would heal from this wound and that it would receive worldwide honor and prestige. And so did the papacy match this point? Well, let's go to history. Let's see what happened. It is exactly what happened. Because you can see after 1798, the papacy went through years where it was weakened. It didn't have the power that it once had. But a significant event took place. And this took place in 1929. And it's very interesting because even the New York Times, the prominent newspaper, the New York Times, reveals to us that the mortal wound was healed. This is a secular newspaper. Can you imagine almost the exact wording of the Bible from the book of Revelation? And it tells us that the mortal wound of the papacy was healed. It's almost as if God inspired the writers of the newspaper to use prophetic language so that his people would know that prophecy was being fulfilled. And so this took place in 1929 and it was an agreement between Benito Mussolini 
and also the, uh, the Secretary of State of the uh, Papacy, whose name was Cardinal Gaspari, all right? And in this agreement, the Vatican, which is the headquarters of the Catholic Church, actually became a sovereign power. All right, they became a nation. They became an official recognized nation. And so the mortal wounds between the papacy and the rest of Europe was healed. And this was in 1929. And I believe this was just the beginning because we have seen that as history has continued, we can see leaders from around the world and nations from around the world have begun to warm up to Rome. They have begun to accept the papacy as a world power. They flock to come to visit the Pope, to give him homage, to give him honor. And we can see that the deadly wound of the papacy is being fulfilled before our very eyes. In fact, right in my home country of the USA, um, during the, the funeral of um, Pope John Paul II, which was a very popular pope, we can see that leaders, presidents of our nation, of one of the most powerful nations in the world, they came to pay the pope homage. They kneeled before him. And friends, it's crystal clear that the deadly wound has been healed and is in the process of continuing to heal. Now, friends, this is an amazing occurrence because at one point in this uh, of the U.S. history, we would have never imagined the Pope being welcomed into our country. In fact, the United States of America was founded on the principle of religious and political freedom. That nation was started as a beacon of light, a beacon of freedom. And the leaders said that we want to have a nation we want to have a, um, a, a nation without a king, and we want to have a religion without a pope. And so, and I'm going to talk more about that later, um, but it's something to consider. It's something to consider. Many of, many of us here in this room are Protestants, all right? We believe that the Protestant Reformation, the birth of all the churches that we have, um, was in protest to the papacy, all right? That's why we're called Protestants, because there was a protest. But many Protestants have forgotten who they protested against. And they are reaching across the gulf and clasping hands with Rome. And the Bible predicted that the whole world would wander after the beast. Okay, and so that brings us to our fifth point. We've seen that the papacy clearly identifies these identifying points. And the next point that we will consider is that the papacy would rule over the saints for 1260 years. Is this true? Well, we've already studied about the deadly wounds that the papacy would receive in 1798. All right, this would be the end, this would be the final events in the rule of the papacy. But when did the papacy come into power? When did they begin to receive their power. Well, let us consider that. This is a timeline. This is 1798, which we have already seen. And we can see that in 1798, once again, that's when the papacy received its deadly wound. But it gained its power, and don't miss this point, the papacy would gain its power in AD 538. All right? And what happened at this event in 538 was that the three remaining kingdoms. Let, let's take a step back. All right. If you remember our previous study about Daniel chapter 2, all right, you will remember that in the very toes of that image, in the feet of that image, that Europe would be divided. Okay, that Rome would be divided into ten kingdoms. All right, and then the feet of that image would represent those ten kingdoms, the ten toes. Now, each of those 10 kingdoms, they have a modern nation in Europe now that they turned into, okay? Except for three. There were three of those countries that the Bible prophesied in Daniel would be uprooted. And those three countries that were uprooted, yes, we can see that in history, they were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. You might never have heard of those because they don't exist anymore. 
The Bible says that they would be uprooted by the little horn power. And by the way, the little horn is the same as the Antichrist. The two have the same description. So as Daniel speaks of the little horn, we can know that it's referring to the Antichrist of Revelation. And so this little horn, this Antichrist, the Bible prophesied would uproot these three kingdoms. Did that happen? Yes, it did. In 530 AD, 538 AD, excuse me, the third of these kingdoms was uprooted. The third of these kingdoms was uprooted. These were nations that they had religious disagreements with the church, and so the Catholic Church uprooted them. They took them out. And in 538 began the reign of the papacy. And this would last for 1260 years. And it would last until 1798 AD. All right, now, what's interesting is how long is that time period between 538 and 1798? It's exactly how many years? Exactly 1260 years. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that powerful? That God knows the end from the beginning. And once again, friends, we can be sure that the Bible doesn't guess. It knows. God knows the end from the beginning. And this is a perfect fulfillment. And you will notice, friends, that some of these identifying marks are very, very specific. And so we can be confident that the power that is matching these points, there's no other power in world history that even comes close to matching these identifying marks. All right, so we have seen that the papacy, once again, it matches the identifier um, that it would reign for um, 1260 years. Okay, and that was actually point five. All right, so point six, let us consider the next. The Bible says that this power would be guilty of blasphemy. All right, and again, we've seen that blasphemy is claiming to forgive sins and also claiming to be God. Is it true that the papacy is guilty of these things? Do they claim to forgive sins? Do they claim to be God? Well, let us look at their very own statements. Let us look at what they say themselves. All right, does the priest truly forgive sins or does he only declare that they are remitted? The priest does, not, does really and truly forgive sins and the virtue of the power given to him by Christ. Do you see that, friends? Does this power claim to forgive sins? Yes, they do. And friends, I want to be clear tonight. I want to be tactful. I want to say how much I love Catholics and how much God loves Catholics. But friends, the system, the system is corrupt. It's blasphemous. This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And this power claims to have the ability to forgive sins. Um, we can read in the Catholic National. This is official Catholic documentation. And it says, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself hidden under the veil of flesh. Now, that should cause you to gasp. That should cause you to be in shock. It does for me. Friends, this is a blasphemous statement. It's blasphemy. There is no God except God who is in heaven. Jesus does not have someone who is his equal in terms of a human being. Only God is God. And this power, this blasphemous power, has claimed to be Jesus Christ himself in the flesh. And so once again, matching the fulfillment of this prophecy. We also read, um, this is taken from the, the Lateran Council. Again, these are official. These are solid, documented resources. It says, we, referring to the popes, they hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but the God I serve is not in Rome. It's not in some room or some castle, but the God I serve is in heaven. And that's the only God we serve, is our Father who is in heaven. And so I want to make it plain and clear, friends, what this organization claims to believe. Let's look at point seven, that it would make war with the saints. 
it would make war with the saints. And so is this true? Now let's read another quote. This is a historical resource. And we read, the church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind. This will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. And friends, if you've ever studied history, you know that the holy wars filled the nation of Europe with blood. In fact, conservative estimates, they tell us that during the Middle Ages of history, over 50 million people were slaughtered, were killed, their blood poured. Why? Because they would not accept the teachings of the Roman church. You had the Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition is one of the most famous, one of the most infamous and deadly of the branches of the papacy. You have the Jesuit order, which was um, specifically created as being the military arm of the papacy. And friends, this is a reality. This is a true part of history. And this is a black eye that the church has of the mass bloodshed that they have caused. All right, so we have seen without a doubt that this power meets the seventh characteristic that it would make war with the saints. It would make war with God's people. In fact, no other organization in the world fills that point or any of the others so perfectly as the papacy. But next we see that this blasphemous power would receive worship as a religious power. So we've already seen that this would be a nation, but the Bible says that it would receive worship. And so this is a very unique nation. What is, can you think of another nation in this world that would actually receive worship? There's only one. Did you know that the Catholic Church is a, is a country? It's the only religious organization in the world that is also a country. All right, it's, it's listed on the world's um, list of nations. And it's the world's smallest nation. All right, Vatican City is actually a country, but it's also a religious power. Is it true that the Catholic Church receives worship? Is that a religious power? Yes, there's no doubt. Okay, it's one of the, I believe it's the largest religion in the entire world. All right, so once again, fulfilling this point exactly. So you can see why the Protestant reformers, Martin Luther and John Calvin and uh, Zwingli and all these um, great men of faith who started the Protestant faith, you can see that they preached and taught this with full confidence because the Bible is so crystal clear um, about this identity. But we can also see the, not, the next point is that it would have the number of a man. It would have the number of a man um, and once again, we've seen that it's a religious power. Um, but it, it would have the number of a man, okay? And this number would be 666. Okay, does the papacy receive this, this point? Does this fit the papacy as the other points have? Now, I want to share with you, friends, that, and this one is a very interesting one, the Pope, <coughs> pardon me, the Pope, <coughs> On his official hat, they call it a mitre. Um, on the, the inscription on the official hat or mitre of the Pope is actually a word that's called vicarious philae die. It's a Latin phrase, which means vicar of God. Now, if you look at this word, vicar of God, which is on the official mitre or hat of the Pope, you will see that the Roman numeral equivalence for this Latin phrase is none other than the number of 666. Okay, can we get any more specific? All right, so every Latin letter has a numeric value. And as you take the official inscription from the Pope's mitre or hat, and we, we compare the equivalent, the numerical equivalent, it adds up to the number that Revelation prophesied, the number of 666. All right, and this is not the only identifying fact. This is just number nine. And in fact, if you continue on to Daniel, 
you'll see additional identifying marks. And friends, we can have no doubt, we can be fully confident that the only power in world history that matches these marks is none other than the papacy, the Roman church. All right, I hope that's clear to you this evening. God wants us to know the truth. All right, and friends, at this point, I wanna to try to put this message in context because this can be a very hard hitting message. All right, it can be very direct, but I wanna make this point. The only reason that Jesus reveals this to you tonight is because he loves you. He wants you to be prepared. He wants you to know what is coming in world history. He wants you to know the last day events of prophecy so that you can be protected. This message, yes, it's a message of warning, but it's a message of love. And friends, I hope you can see that these meetings, they're not just your everyday Bible meetings. I believe that God has brought you here for a purpose. I believe that he has seen that you are ready to hear his last day message and to go by the Bible to go by the Bible only and not by the traditions of men. And friends, as we look at the book of Revelation, many churches will, will gloss over that book. They'll say, we don't need to understand Revelation. It's mysterious. It's not for us. But friends, the words of Jesus say differently. Consider these words of Jesus at the beginning of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. We read in Revelation 1, 3, Blessed, blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. And friends, Jesus is telling you tonight that you listening to these messages of revelation, that you are blessed. This isn't a, a, a doom and gloom. This is a warning. This is a message of hope. This is hope through prophecy because Jesus as the center of prophecy is the one that is giving you this message of warning. And he is offering to be your protection, to be your Lord in these final days. And you will notice, friends, in the verse that the blessing is not just to those who hear, it's not just to those who read, but it's to those who keep the words of this prophecy. And so my appeal to you this evening, friends, is to be not hearers of the word only, but to be doers of God's holy word. And I hope and pray that this message this beautiful end time message of Revelation 14, the three angels message. I hope and pray that you let it touch your heart, that you let it change your life and begin to practice the things that Jesus reveals to you. And friends, as we consider this message, we have so much on the horizon. We've identified the beast of Revelation that might have been a shocking eye opener. But friends, there's so much more to come. Because in Revelation 14, God gives his most solemn warning to the world in which he tells us not to receive the mark of the beast. And so we will see from the Bible what that mark is and how we can avoid it. And friends, as we invite the choir forward, I pray that you re will reflect on this message. And I hope that you are thankful to God that not me, but he, has revealed this message to you. Not everyone understands this, friends, but you have been blessed. You have been honored by God to hear his last day warning. And friends, is it your desire this evening to say, Jesus, I put my arm in yours. Jesus, I turn to you. And friends, if that's your desire, please raise your hand this evening. Amen. Praise God. And friends, we can be safe. We can be safe if we put our trust in him. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the clarity and the certainty of your holy word. 
And Father, we are so grateful for this urgent reminder, this urgent warning that you have given to us. And Father, as we see this warning, let us not be filled with fear, but hope. Hope that you are coming again soon. Hope that we can put our trust in you and hope that you will make it victorious for us as we cling to you and trust in you. And Father, I pray for all of us that we would stay faithful, putting our trust fully in Jesus. And Lord, we pray these things. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.